welcome to Passing Pathophysiology, Potassium Imbalances. My name is David Woodruff, and I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you, too. Let's talk about potassium. So potassium is our major intracellular ion. Now, remember, we talked about having this balance between positive and negative ions when we talked about sodium. And so sodium is the major extracellular cation, and potassium is the major intracellular cation. We get it from our food, so we get it in the diet. It's excreted in the urine, and typically it doesn't matter how much potassium you take in in your diet. So long as you have normal renal function, you're just going to excrete it in the urine. It's not going to be a big deal. Where we run into problems then would be somebody who has either the inadequate ingestion of potassium or somebody who is having problems either excreting urine or having too much urine, as in diuresis. Insulin also is going to be have an effect here, and it's driving potassium into our cells. Another factor that's involved in moving our potassium around is our acid-base balance. Now, because potassium is the major intracellular cation, when we have other positive ions coming to the cell and coming into the cell, such as what happens in acidosis, potassium has to leave the cell. Otherwise, there's too much positive charge, and that's going to cause problems with our cell. Same thing happens in alkalosis. In alkalosis... Our hydrogen ions are leaving the cell and they're leaving the body or they're being put somewhere away from our cells and therefore potassium rushes into the cell. So this is what happens and what changes when we have acidosis or alkalosis. We can run into one of these different situations. All right, so what does potassium do? Well, it maintains our intracellular fluid volume. So it helps to maintain how much fluid is inside the cell and keep that cell from becoming dehydrated or overhydrated. It's involved in cellular metabolism, so really important for the cell to be able to continue to function. It's involved in nerve conduction and in muscle contraction. We're going to take a look at this again when we talk about hypokalemia here, but you can see on our EKG that we're going to have issues with our conduction, the electrical conduction, when we have alterations in our potassium level. So let's talk first about hypokalemia. This is a potassium level of less than 3.5 milliequivalents per liter. Well, we're going to end up with not enough potassium when there's losses. So, for example, in diarrhea and diureses, so the patient is losing potassium and not taking in enough to be able to replace what's being lost. Steroids can cause hypokalemia. A decreased dietary intake can cause hypokalemia, along with the treatment of DKA with insulin. Insulin pushes potassium back into the cell in the same way that it pushes glucose into cells. Alkalosis is another one of those conditions that can cause hypokalemia as well. So let's take a look at what we see as far as our symptoms of hypokalemia. EKG changes, which can lead to dysrhythmias. Some could be life-threatening. As you see here on the EKG, with hypokalemia, we're going to have a flattened out T wave. And in fact, repolarization is going to be extended, prolonged. And this is one of those times you might even see a U wave. A U wave is a wave that comes right after the T wave. And it's an indication of prolonged repolarization. Muscle weakness, paresthesias, anorexia, nausea, so some GI distress as well. Uh, let's take a look at the opposite situation then. Here we have hyperkalemia, which is a potassium level greater than 5 milliequivalents per liter. Typically, this is going to happen with renal failure. As I mentioned before, if you have good renal function, then there's no reason why your potassium level should get high, even if you have a high potassium intake as far as oral intake. Potassium-sparing diuretics can keep the kidneys from dumping excess potassium. Trauma and burns, because remember, potassium is inside the cell, so with trauma or with burns, 
Potassium gets released from the cell and gets into the bloodstream. Acidosis can also cause our problems with hyperkalemia. We're going to take a look at our symptoms here in a minute, but as you see the difference in our EKG over to the right, we have a very tall peaked T wave, so we have a very dramatic repolarization that occurs when we have hyperkalemia. Hyperkalemia, like hypokalemia, can also cause cardiac dysrhythmias, leading to cardiac arrest, muscle weakness, paralysis, fatigue, nausea, paresthesias, and one dysrhythmia that's very common with having hyperkalemia is atrial fibrillation. That's what we're seeing here in the EKG. Well, thank you for joining me for Passing Pathophysiology, Potassium Imbalances. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time...